everyone. We're really excited to have our second Cooking with Vivian event. Our first event was uh, during a, a annual conference, I think, a couple of years ago. And what did you cook, Vivian? I don't remember. I made um, butter. I it is basically a recipe for butter Indian butter chicken, but I made it with tofu. Okay. Um, because a lot of people said that they don't know how to cook with tofu or tofu, um, and uh, and we do all the time. So I thought, well, that will be a good thing. And yeah. There were a few people who made it along. I think Shannon yeah. did and Christina, and then they were showing their plates at the end. It was really kind of fun. Yeah. Well, it was it was a wonderful event and really fun. I think. Um, for the staff to connect with Vivian in this way. Um, we, Britt and I are always talking about um, uh, Tanil from the Tokyo Study Center and how excited she was. I know, I don't know if she's online tonight with us, but we're so thrilled to have Vivian Lee Nyatre with us tonight. Um, she is the Executive Director and Associate Vice Provost for UCEAP. And before that, she was a member of the Religious Studies faculty at UC Riverside for over 20 years. And um, she, in addition to um, her current work with UCEAP, she was also a faculty director in the Netherlands for us before she became our executive director. So we are thrilled to have you with us tonight, Vivian, and I will let you kick off your... Okay, thank uh, you. Well, it was bol bolognese. Um, Bul yep. Bulg Bulgogi Bolognese. Bulgogi exactly. Bolognese. They, now I can say it. Global fusion, uh, global smash up. Uh, and um, it really kind of speaks to the way I like to think about UCEAP in terms of bringing different parts of the world together. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, when you do that, uh, you know, 99% of the time you come up with something that is uh, you know, really interesting um, and uh, and has legs for the future. Uh, so I'm hopeful that um, you know this might do that for you. Um, it is it is as I've said extraordinarily easy. Um, and I did distribute an ingredients list before. I don't know if anyone is cooking along, but um, we can just get started. I hope this is you. You wouldn't believe this sort of uh, Rube Goldberg setup I've got here. Um, I've got uh, an extension ladder with a um, piece of plywood with the New Yorker Encyclopedia of Cartoons, which is about this big, um, to be a platform for my laptop. Uh, and so um, it's pretty primitive, but um, I hope that it will work. And, um, you know, I'm happy to tell you about I'll tell you a little bit about UCEAP and give you some updates um, later on. There is a period where things just have to kind of cook along. Uh, so I will do that at that point. And I know Bryn has some other things for us. But um, if there are general questions about anything that you'd like to ask, um, put them in the in the chat and Bryn will read them out for me. Um, and I'm happy to, 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 to talk about whatever it is that comes to mind. So the first thing is, we're going to um, just heat the pot, and I have here, let me move my stool back, I have my favorite giant, can you see this? I, can't, I wish I could zoom, my favorite giant blue Dutch oven, uh, and, um, and for me it is a Dutch oven, I love it because it's kind of, it really is for me kind of a combination of all the places that I've lived and worked for long periods of time, it's a Dutch oven, and I was in the Netherlands for years, and that's where I started my study abroad, actually, uh, when I was in college. Um, but it's also rounded. It doesn't have the straight side, so it's rounded like a wok. Um, and I spent, of course, many years of my life in China. So for me, this blue pot is just like the quintessential pot. Uh, I may have to ask to be buried with it or something. I'm not sure. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get um the vegetables kind of simmering and so the first thing is we need a cup of uh of uh, onion so this is about a cup i'm actually a little fast and loose with measurements um and i just sort of eyeball it and think yeah that's about a cup and most of the time i don't think you can really uh, go too far uh, wrong if it's a little more or a little bit less Okay, so 
we cut up these uh, onions here. And then we have our first question in the chat, which is uh, from Virginie who asks, where is your handsome husband? Will he say hello? He's <laughs> gonna make an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> handsome husband is in the bedroom keeping the dog quiet, uh, uh, but he will appear. He was actually here before. Um, and he can appear again. We can have him do a command performance uh, at the end. Uh, how's that? I um, have heard wonderful a reputation of his musical talent, so I'm excited for his impromptu performance later on. Ah, uh, well, you know, that's an interesting thing because so this is canola oil that I just poured in about two tablespoons or so. Um, yeah, Douglas was a professional musician and dancer. Uh, he used to perform with the Amman International Folk Ensemble in Los Angeles. And they sort of brought world music to uh, the US and Southern California in particular. So I'm going to uh, put the onions on a medium, medium high heat for about three minutes or so. So they brought world music to LA before the name for that genre really uh, existed. Uh, so uh, yes, so he is a, but um, Douglas has multiple sclerosis, he has a handicap. And so it is more challenging for him to play and to, to dance these days. But every now and then I can, I can cajole him. Uh, our daughter is named for- um, Hey Becky. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Our daughter is named for the favorite <clears throat> song that he used to play that I love to hear him play. Our daughter's name is Shady Grove. And that's a very famous Appalachian uh, love song. And it's either about a girl or a place uh, called Shady Grove. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Doc Watson, if you know anything about folk music, Doc Watson, uh, we really like his version of it. And um, and that's what she's named for. Okay, so while the onion goes here, just stir it from time to time. The lighter. Uh, then I'm going to cut up the other root vegetables that'll go in next. And <clears throat> as I said, you can use a combination of carrots uh, or parsnips. I wouldn't use turnips, I don't think, but um, carrots or parsnips, and you just want to cut them up pretty finely. Um, and uh, chop them up a bit. I do have a food processor, a small one, but um, I'm not friends with it yet. So uh, I prefer, I figure by the time I get the vegetable and then I cut it into pieces to fit into the food processor, and then I whiz it and it makes that really annoying, you know, sound and it's hurting my ears, I might as well just cut it. So that's what I do. Hey, Vivian, we have another question from Janet, who studied in Japan. Yes. Um, do you think that this recipe is easily doubled? Yes, yes. Another very important question from Armando is, will your dog be tasting the food afterwards? Uh, yes. The dog doesn't taste all food, but um, because the dog is on a special diet, but the owners are soft touches. And so the dog does get a little tiny bit of everything. And plus, she's only 15 pounds. She's a, I guess there is a name for her. She's a chewini. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's a chihuahua and a, and a dachshund. But she's also got beagle in there because she's a little taller. So we call her a chewiggle hunt. And so um, she gets, she's only 15 pounds, though. So. I've never had a small dog before her. I always had big dogs. So this has been an adventure in small dogdom. Um, very odd, but she has sort of wormed her way into our hearts. Vivian, I'm very impressed. Your knife looks nice and sharp. I can't keep my knife sharp. I have to keep reminding Douglas to please help okay. me. Okay, I need Douglas to come over and sharpen my knife. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be happy to do that. Okay, so this is a parsnip. Um, and so I'm just using half carrot, half parsnip, just to kind of vary the taste a little bit. They're a little tougher to cook, uh, to chop. Okay. 
Vivian, how long have you been a vegetarian? Pardon me? How long have you been a vegetarian? Uh, well, I'm actually a flexitarian. Um, it's um, for two reasons. One is that I'm entertained a lot by other people over the years. And, um, and I always want to make things not hard for whoever's entertaining. And so um, there are a few things that I stopped eating um, when I was a teenager. And I won't, I really won't eat. But otherwise, <clears throat> I will. And the one thing that I will always, I have a very hard time turning down is pork. And this is a real ethical dilemma for me because pigs are very smart animals and um, and I really, I really, you know, have to think about, you know, do I really want to, do I really want to eat this? But I've decided that because um, I'm Hungarian, uh, if I don't eat pork from time to time, I might die. <laughs> so I have to, uh, from time to time, uh, indulge. But I can go for weeks and, and months and not not miss it. Our daughter has been a vegetarian. She's in her mid thirties, and she's been a vegetarian since she was eight. Uh, she was in uh, elementary school, and as a treat for the kids, for some reason, they showed the movie Babe. And she was just traumatized when Babe's mother is taken off to the slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, she decided she never wanted to eat meat again, and she has not. So, uh, and that's why also she really rides hard on me about the pork issue. But see, she doesn't understand because she's only half Hungarian. Okay, so now I'm going to put in the parsnips, and she doesn't have the same cravings, I think. And the carrot. And I'm going to cook this for about two minutes or so, just so it gets a little bit soft. It's starting to smell really good. Sorry, we don't have smell-o-vision, but it's starting to smell really good. Maybe okay. on our third Cooking with Vivian event, we'll integrate that technology. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to talk to Thomas about this, right? I, uh, I also, with Babe, it's such an impactful film. I, when I was a kid, I was a child actress and I worked with James Cromwell and I didn't realize that he had such a strong passion for veganism. And I used to eat bacon on set every single day while I like sat in his lap. <laughs> it was uh, maybe not the best choice from a child's perspective. <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, I actually, I have to confess, I have never seen Gabe because it wasn't allowed in our house because then there would be just too many tears. So I've actually never seen it. I think I've seen little bits of it here and there. Uh, I did see the famous scene where Babe's mom goes off. So that seemed to be sufficient. I have no idea how it ends. Um, don't no spoilers, please. I might watch it sometime before I die. I don't know. Okay. I don't know if you need the more complicated feelings around the occasional pork, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so while that's cooking, I'm just taking advantage of the time. Oh, Douglas, please come in and show your face. There was a request for my handsome husband to show his face. <laughs> No, turn around. <laughs> oh, okay. Still Hello, handsome. everybody. Hey. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hello, everybody. I have to get low. Good to see you. Usually, I'm standing by Vivian when she makes a stitch, but I just drool the whole time, and she tells me to get out of the kitchen. So, this is one of my favorite dishes. Yeah. Right? Yep. She yeah, says, absolutely. get out. I didn't say that. I know. Not yet. She will. <laughs> okay, turn the heat down a little bit just so nothing burns, but continues to kind of soften. And then the next thing is, I told you you needed seven um, cloves of garlic. And so I skinned most of them, but I'll do these last two and then chop them up and throw them in there. And uh, ginger, oops, putting them in the wrong place. 
I always have a bowl here, a sort of a slop bowl for putting vegetable odds and ends in. Okay. So, um, yeah, any questions? Any, anything else before we get this here and get the ginger ready? I think Janet is doing her best to keep up with you. <laughs> oh, hey, Janet. You, you haven't put the celery in yet, have you, right? Not now? yet, not yet. Okay, okay. It's just the carrots and onion. That's right. And, okay. And I just was take because those are hard, they take a while. So I get the, uh, the uh, parsnips and the carrots, I get those in first. And then I just take advantage of whatever time I have to chop everything else. But um, we could do the celery uh, at this point. Let me check this. Yeah, we can just, you can just chop up the celery and again about a cup of celery. Would there be another any particular chefs or programs that you like watching that inspire you as a cook? Any kind of you know, I never really watched cooking shows. Um, although when I was young, I did see Julia Child on public TV. Um, always thought she was the weirdest thing going, but I just loved her. I just loved her. I thought she was just so authentic and honest and and fun and weird, <laughs> you know. Um, and I think actually something that I kind of learned from her, I suppose is that um, if you make a mistake, it's it's really not the end of the world. Uh, you know, you can always recover. Uh, most things. I think there was only one recipe that Douglas and I have ever done, uh, and I'm including myself here to spare him embarrassment, uh, but it was a soup that called for a lot of cloves. And I think we should change the channel now. <laughs> Because um, Douglas didn't understand that uh, that cloves a little goes a long way, and he put the cloves in whatever it called for, and he thought, oh no, that can't be right. They must mean like maybe it comes like a like a whole flower, and I need like more. So he put in so many cloves that it is the only thing we have ever made that I actually had to, to dump out. I, I We could not eat it. We just could not eat it. That's the kind of dish you might've been able to smell even through Zoom. <laughs> I think that's true. The infamous clove soup. Clove soup, exactly. But you know, I am a real fan of Chef uh, Jose Andres, mm. who runs the World Central Kitchen. And he has now in the Ukraine, he has, prepared and offered something on the order of two million plus meals. Um, you know, whenever there is a um, natural disaster, human made disaster, uh, he and World Central Kitchen are there uh, to make sure that people are nourished. Mm -hmm. And I find that so inspirational. Um, he was interviewed by Arts and Lectures at UCSD and I wasn't able to see the um, the um, interview, but it was recorded. And when I came home from wherever I was, Douglas said to me, I don't want you to watch this. And I asked, well, why not? And he said, because I think you'll fall in love with him. <laughs> and I watched it. And in fact, I did. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I won't run away and join the circus, but I might, you know, Someday run away and join World Central Kitchen. Um, I think he does amazing things. And he has a great cookbook called um, Vegetables Unleashed. Uh, that's a very good vegetarian uh, cookbook. Highly uh, sort of Spain inflected, uh, but but really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Check it out. This is going to go get it and show it to you. OK, so then we get the, the celery in. Janet, how's it going? You keeping up? 
Excellent. Oh, wow. I can see why you were wooed, Vivian. What a what a unique photograph of that man. <laughs> oh, he's amazing. He is. And he talked about his wife and his daughters with such love and respect. It was so amazing. That was great. Sarah oh says in the chat, he's such a powerful speaker. I had the chance to hear him at NAFSA a few years back, and he had everyone's yes. ears. That's right. That's right. I heard him there, too. It was really wonderful. Okay, I've got the celery in. And we're going to let that cook a little bit here. So like I said, this is ridiculously easy. We've got all the root vegetables in there, the celery is in there, um, and that should go for about five minutes. But I don't sort of wait strictly, wait five minutes and then do the next step. I just keep moving along. So I've got the, the garlic, and um, I'm thinking that they probably think this uh, is a clove of garlic, but I think this is a clove of garlic. So if it asks for seven, I've probably got nine or ten, and that's fine, right? I think garlic is one of those things that you can almost never have too much of. Absolutely agreed. Catherine would like you to know that um, East Coast Kathy, Catherine is watching. Kathy is watching today. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I like your total neck, Kathy. It's lovely. Nice and bright. Whoops. Okay. All right. So we've got the garlic here. Let me chop it up a little bit more. Vivian, if a recipe calls for shredding garlic, you know, I, I never end up shredding it because you hurt your hands. It's a pain in the butt. Do you ever do it or do you always chop it? No, I don't always chop it. Um, I do do other things. I mince it sometimes with a garlic press. And I also have one of those little ginger um, fish uh, that you can grate the ginger on. And you can do that with garlic. And that doesn't hurt your hands, you know, quite the same way. Um, so, uh, but, you know, in the, it depends really in the end. I mean, if they're looking for it to have a certain look, you want to try and get that look. But if it's just going in the pot, <laughs> I really don't think it makes a cosmic difference. Being in religious studies, I'm very attuned to cosmic things. Cosmic garlic, first I've heard of it. We have our special guest joining us now. Tanil is coming in. Hey. <laughs> Not to pressure. No, I think you might be here. If Tanil is on, I'm going to say, hey, Tanil, my cooking buddy. <laughs> I think she's just joined us. Just coming in? Okay. All right. Oh, and I forgot to say the indispensable ingredient in all of this, of course, is a glass of wine. You need this while you are cooking. The must have. I think okay. Julia Child would agree. I think so too. Yeah. Or an adult beverage of your choice. All right. So we've got the garlic in there. And now I'm going to peel the ginger. And chop that up and throw it in. Here it is. This one there, right? Yeah, that's it, right. So you can This is Vivian's ginger thing. Fish. Fish. Oh. It's a ginger fish. You can I don't know if you can see it. It's little almost I'm sorry, pin like uh, things on there. So it shreds it up pretty well. Thanks, Douglas. That's yeah. really cool. They have those in all different types of shapes and sizes too. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. I've had this Brain, one forever. You could make one in ceramics. I could make one in ceramics. Yeah, I, I that would be a new challenge in hand building. I think that's more up your alley than mine. But <laughs> no. you know what I've seen people use like a little tiny cheese grater and they grate the yeah. garlic on it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a man. Five and that's gonna get on it. Shut the man more. <laughs> nice. Hey guys, sorry. Sorry, I'm late to join. I just wanted to say hi, Vivian. <laughs> hi, Vivian. I'm so glad to see you. I like your little <laughs> I like your little fish. <laughs> <laughs> we like your hair, Tanil. Pardon me? I like Tanil's hair. It's really yeah. fun. It's bright pink. I don't know if you can I see know. it. Again. I wish I had the courage to do that. You could do it. 
Yeah, maybe I'll come in one day with purple. <laughs> we can all assign ourselves a portion of the rainbow. <laughs> Right, you so can do the, the sneaky too. Got the ginger in. And so just stirring. And give it a minute or two there. And I'm going to just start slowly heating the pot for the egg noodles on the other burner. So we've got the um, root vegetables, celery, the ginger, the garlic. Now, um, we need to have the tomato paste. And so I have some that was left from another use the other day. And uh, I put it in a baby food. I did say container. it was one of my favorite dishes. <laughs> did I have to send you away? <laughs> no, you could be useful. Could you give me a small spatula from the drawer? I can't get past the Rube Goldberg ladder thing to get to the utensil draw. Ah. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. So we're going to need uh, two, two tablespoons of, of, of tomato paste and just put them in. That's one. And here's two. Sorry, you just get to see my back. It's so boring. But you know, if we were lucky enough to be able to move out to the property on campus that we're looking at, the Devereaux property, that has a proper kitchen in it, actually. Mm. Um, and so that could be kind of fun. And uh, we could get uh, various people to help us with cooking uh, things. All right, so we've got the tomato paste in here now. Mix it all up. This smelling is so good. Vivian, I'm curious because Santa Barbara isn't really known for its culinary. Um, I, it's not a culinary hub. Do you have particular restaurants in the area that you like more than others that you and I Douglas do. tend to go to? I do, I do. And, um, but the thing is, I, I feel really bad saying it. I don't feel like I should advertise because I think that there are other restaurants that maybe I haven't been to yet and I don't want them to be left out. Um, I will say that we're very curious about the Brass Bear Uptown, which uh, opened up here a couple of weeks ago where um, Cafe Stella used to be. Uh, they have so many cars parked there every night that they now only have valet parking on weekends. Um, it's just enormous, just filled with people all the time. And so we're gonna have to go there. It's a burger and brewery place, but still, you know, it seems to have a good following. Andrea right. says she's been, and she said it was excellent. Try Thursday about four to 5 p.m. Oh, okay, all right. That's a good, a good hit. That would be a good time. Yeah, thank you. We will do that. Um, so can't do it today, but we'll do it another time. Okay, so when you've got the tomato paste in, you might want to lower the heat a little bit um, because you don't want everything to start to burn. And now um, we're going to put in the meat. So this is Impossible Burger. Um, I think that um, <clears throat> Impossible and uh, also Beyond Meat they have different textures and they, I think, are good for different things. There are also other plant-based uh, meat substitutes that we like for using in various ways, but um, I really like Impossible Burger for this. So, uh, because I think it, it um, I don't even know why, I just think it reacts better somehow. It just seems to, to feel better. So I just dump that in and then break it up a bit. I'm glad they totally stopped advertising it as the one that breathes. Pardon me? Pardon? Um, it's always interesting to see meat substitutes. Um, my roommate and I were thinking that maybe you would use the, you know, the thin, um, it's like tofu, but it's like fried tofu. I don't know what you call it. It's, you mean anyway, tempeh? we thought maybe you would need. Tempeh. Sorry? Mm -hmm. 
Ten, is yeah, it kind of, uh, no. or Satan? No. Satan? No. It's like, um, it's like flat and then it's kind of like a fried skin, tofu skin. Oh, that sounds awful, but mean. it's really delicious. Yeah, I yeah. think I know what you mean. There's so many kinds of tofu, right? And then there's like dopey, which is like, I only, I, I know it in Chinese rather than Japanese, but it's like the skin, they call it. So it's a little um, more robust and that's really delicious. And then sometimes I take that and they tie it in little knots, uh, you know, that you can put into soup and things. Yes. Yeah, really wonderful. Yeah, have you done it? Have you had it with the rice mochi in the pocket? Like they call it golden pocket or treasure pocket or something like that. Have, yeah. And they put like a hard, oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Tamil, we're going to need you to do yeah. a cooking thing here. That's what's going to need to happen. So we've got the, the, <laughs> the, the impossible in there. And now I've got um, the mushrooms, which we cut up a minute or two ago. And those go in as well. I said this is the most ridiculously easy dish. Your dog agrees. Pardon me? Okay, so there's says your dog Your agreed. dog agrees. Oh, yeah, she shouldn't be outside the door there. Yeah, she's outside. She wants to come in. Um, yeah, she does. Well, no, I can't let her in <laughs> because she'll be all over the place. I'm going to cut up um, about a half a cup of scallions and throw those in as well. Interesting to put the garlic before the scallions. I find that the onion, really, onion type vegetables can cook, they need longer? Why, why the garlic first? Um, I don't know. <laughs> was, I don't know. I always put it in as early as possible, I think, because I'm excited to have it. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but uh, but it's in there. I think it also flavors. I mean, if you're using ground uh, beef, for example, um, it's going to flavor the fat that comes out of the ground beef. Mm -hmm. So in this way, we have a little bit of oil in the pan, and it will um, you know help flavor that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and before the onion goes in, uh, and I don't really know why. I never actually really thought about it. Thank you. I'll think about it. All right, so I've got about uh, a little more than a, a generous half cup, and I'll put that in. All right, now we're going to add the liquid to it. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what somebody said. Someone joined our, our chat, so they were. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so now we're going to get um, three quarters of a cup of soy sauce. Danielle says that you have the perfect cooking show voice. <laughs> I have um, the low sodium. I use low sodium soy sauce. So it's making its way out here. Because I find that. Is, the is it okay? Is it okay if I don't double the soy sauce? Because I'm making a double batch. Um, I think I put in maybe one and a half. Okay, thanks. Janet, I like this new angle you've presented us. I feel like your presentation here is very uh, cinematic. I've gotten lots of different perspectives on your cooking. <laughs> All right, so here's uh, the soy sauce. And then I'm gonna have to leave. I have I have to leave you for a moment to go get uh, water, and I just want to make sure, yeah, that I've got it. So I'm gonna put in a quarter of a cup of of water. So again, I probably if you're doubling it, I probably put in just about a half a cup because it'll evaporate. Mm -hmm. So there's my quarter of a cup. And then this is where um, the original recipe by Kay Chun uh, called for a quarter of a cup of sugar. And I almost never put in as much sugar or as much salt as they call for, but I usually just take half. So this is turbinado sugar, and I'm going to put in um, about an eighth of a cup. Uh, now, how is that different from regular sugar? 
It has a little more molasses in it, and so it's a little richer tasting. But you I can see. use white sugar. You can use white yeah, sugar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just used, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just less processed, that's all. But I, I don't think it makes a big taste difference in something like this. Okay, so we've got all that going. We mix it all up. And then here's where the magic happens. We just leave it alone. <laughs> we just cover it and we let it go for probably about 25 minutes or so. And that's it, 25, 30 minutes. And it will just cook down, cover it. Stir it from time to time. I have it on kind of medium. And uh, then when it is done, and we may, you know, end this uh, before it's done, you have your egg noodles that you cook. And then at the end, when it's done, you just ladle it over the egg noodles and then sprinkle some uh, scallions and some uh, grated Parmesan. So you've got the scallions, we've got the Korean part here, and we've got the Italian part here. Uh, and so um, that's it, that's bulgogi bolognese, but it's so delicious. Mm. That's it, so easy. See, all I did was chop and stir and, and talk. That's it, so easy. Thank you so much, that's excellent. I think uh, I'm excited to see the comparison between your dish and Janet's at the very end here. Uh, looking forward to it. Janet, how many people are you cooking for tonight? Is it a dinner party? No, no, no. It's just that I have two 20-some-year-old sons <laughs> who are around <laughs> with my husband. So I have to double the recipe. One pound of, and I use ground beef. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, it, and yeah, anyways, yeah. So, yeah. when I have two out of my three sons home, yeah, I definitely have to cook a little bit more, yeah. <laughs> I, I know years ago our daughter was a synchronized swimmer and they had summer camp and we hosted three uh girls from elsewhere in the country actually one was from um uh panama we ended up with four one from panama one from new york and two from one from vegas i forget where they all came from and you know these girls the exercise that they do in sync. They're burning so many calories. They're just starving all the time. Exactly. And so yeah. I would go shopping twice a day because they would just come home from practice in the afternoon and like tip back the refrigerator and empty it. And then I'd have to go out again. So Vivian, how long were you in China? Um, well, I started going there in 1979 as a grad student and um that was mostly just travel back and forth but then um i was uh, dean of two experimental liberal arts colleges uh, for their first four years the last part of which overlapped with my starting this job at uceap i say no i i i grew up in taiwan i spent 13 years in taiwan well that's where i did so, i was in graduate school in taiwan. so when you were saying the dou pi i said oh ta de but when I, you know, what I love is that um, I, I, when I was there, I wanted to learn Taiwan Hua and it was illegal. Oh, I, I go. Yeah, my parents are Taiwanese, so yeah. Uh, it was illegal. We were not allowed to study oh, it. Because you're so, in China. Yeah. That, well, because at that time it was under martial law. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, um, yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. I remember yeah, Taiwanese was not, not, you know, yeah. Right. Your but now, now when I go back, yeah. you know, you have Taiwanese news reporters. I mean, you know, every programs in Taiwanese, you know, there's a lot of more pride in yeah. the Taiwanese dialect. And I don't speak it that well, but I can definitely understand it. So I'm yeah. just thankful because I went to the American school in Taipei. So English uh -huh. has always been my first language, but I grew up learning Mandarin Chinese and Taiwanese dialect. And then when I went to UC Santa Barbara for college, I, I found out I could study Japanese. So that's why I ended up studying Nihongo and then spent my one year abroad at ICU. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a great story. Yeah. Well, I had a great, I mean, I had a great advantage because I knew how to write kanji. So right, right, right. Yeah. And my problem is that when I'm in Japan, Tanil knows this. 
when I'm in Japan, I can read some things. I did study mm -hmm. Japanese for about two and a half years, but um, I can read some things. But the problem is the pronunciation is completely gone, you know? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I look at something and I see, you know, it could be, uh, you know, Nihongo no Rekishi. But I look mm -hmm. at it in my brain, I say, Nihongo no Lishu. And I switch Lishu. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I switch it to Mandarin because it's more it's 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 more familiar for me so, yeah sometimes i get confused with taiwanese and, and nihongo uh-huh well there's there some words influence yeah 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 exactly well that's interesting yeah no i was at taida for two and a half years hmm. oh yeah my dad graduated from taida great yeah. place great place yeah mm -hmm. Vivi and I have to take off too, um, but it's been so much fun and I can't wait to hear and take pictures of your final dish, okay, so we can okay. share them out to everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you alumni for joining us, but I'm, I'm going to bring your in, in Bryn's hands now and I think uh, she has some trivia questions for you too. I do, yeah. I thought before we started the trivia, for those who are still in the audience, there's still a few alumni and staff members here. Um, I know some people were looking to hear a little update about UCEAP generally from Vivian about what we've been up to since COVID. Um, so we'll do that real quick and then we'll run a little trivia game with those who remain in the audience today. So, um, okay. okay, well, um, I think the, um, the, the sort of big news is that uh, we've been in a V-shaped recovery in terms of enrollment. Uh, and so we're looking, pre-pandemic, we were heading towards 6,000 students. We were just shy of that. And now um, we're looking at 4,000 students out this year uh, and set to grow uh, onward. So that's really positive. Um, I think some things are different. I think that the students who are out now, um, you know, they suffered during COVID. They suffered from isolation. They were not on campus. Uh, or they were, but it was, you know, on again, off again. Um, we think that they missed some opportunities in terms of socialization uh, and the opportunity to really, uh, you know, learn to be working and living with others. Uh, and so we have experienced an uptick in uh, problems with uh, anxiety, uh, loneliness, homesickness, um, roommate disputes. Uh, all of these sorts of things. And yet um, we've been very fortunate. Uh, our, um, she's not really new anymore, she's new-ish, um, International Health Safety and Crisis Management Director um, has helped us contract with a company that provides 24-7 uh, uh, English language counseling for students um, in all of the countries in which we operate. Uh, and they can have up to 20 sessions, depending on how long they are there for free. Uh, this year, that cost for that service is being paid by the Office of the President, which we're very grateful for. And it will be a minimal um, addition to the student budget uh, beginning next year. But I think it's a great boon to have this for the students. Uh, and I'm glad we could do that. The other thing is that we are starting a, um, a program for first year students in the fall of their freshman year. So they would actually start their UC career abroad. Uh, and it's called Global Start. Uh, and it will have a pilot uh, starting in the fall of 2024, uh, if everything can go to plan. Uh, it will have two locations, one in Seville in Spain and the other uh, in Sicily. Uh, and all of the courses are designed to fulfill uh, UC uh, general education requirements so that they will not lose time. They can get into some courses perhaps that are heavily impacted on the campuses um, and plus have a chance to be abroad. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we're staffing up. We're able to, you know, continue um, looking for people to fill our positions. We've been hiring some great people. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of our newest hires is actually on this call. I see John Simone's name uh, here. So he is our new data privacy and compliance uh, officer, and we're delighted to have him. Um, and we've also been hiring other uh, program advisors and um, uh, an accountant, I mean, various kinds of people. So 
um, it feels really good to be back, but but it is a new a new situation we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I did want to make a comment because I studied abroad my junior year, and um, because I was originally a business economics emphasis and accounting major, I had to declare a second major in order to go study abroad. But as I studied abroad, I, I managed to do the summer program plus a full year, but I did not do any accounting. No, no, no. So my thing is that, you know, my undergrad, you know, years, I, I took an extra year. Now I'm very thankful my dad was you know, willing to pay for it. And I never regret spending a full year in Japan. Now my observation, because I feel that, I don't know if students have a harder time going their junior year because they're worried about their courses, the majors, you know, majors, fulfilling their major courses. It's interesting because our youngest son um, is, at, is at Pepperdine and they send their kids sophomore year. So mm -hmm. that, so when I heard about the pilot program, I think that's like very, that's good. That's a good direction because I think kids who miss out on being able to study abroad just because I, you know, I can't take my major, you know, going your junior year is tough because you are taking your major courses. So I, I feel like, you know, Pepperdine has something going with sending their kids sophomore year so yeah. that they come back and they don't miss out on their major. So they, yes, they, they indeed try to, you know, focus on GE uh, fulfillment requirements. So anyways, I'm just glad to hear about that um, freshman year. Um, you know, that, that's a good start, yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing that we have now that helps students um, a lot, we have two things. One is that we offer grants to faculty and staff um, to plan out tracks for students in their major so that they can see it's possible, whatever my major is, to be able to study abroad in this year at this time and do these things. So that's one thing that's growing slowly. The other thing is that we have um, this wonderful course credit abroad program uh, where students can, it's open to the public, students can um, look um, for where they want to go, what their major is, what their campus is, and they can filter in a variety of ways and see what courses other students from their campus took and what kind of credit they got on that campus specifically. And this, I think, gives them greater uh, confidence that whenever they go, what they do will not set them back. Yeah, I mean, we have the advantage of technology and programs now. You know, when I went in 83, you know, it's, it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the good thing is, you know, we didn't have social media and technology. So we get, we, I think we were able to immerse ourselves because we're not checking things all the time, right? And then your focus is on getting to know yeah. people, yeah. more relational, and then getting to know your Japanese room, I mean, your roommates or something like that. So it's its just different, yeah. It's different, it cuts both ways. It, it's, right. you know, there's a, there's a saying in Chinese, you know, everything has its long points. Uh, so everything has a positive, but it also has its, its shortcomings as well, yeah. How's it smelling to you? <laughs> Coming through loud and clear over here. Um, thank you so much for that update, Vivian. That's that's really helpful, I think, for the alumni in the audience to learn a little bit about where we're at now with our students and um, for our staff as well. It's obviously interesting. Um, we have a little trivia game.